Greetings, Earthlings. This is Cody with Nostalgic Nebula. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we have with us screenwriter Neil Marshall Stevens, who has penned screenplays for such horror films as Hellraiser Deader and several of the Puppet Master films, and my personal favorite, 13 Ghosts. Uh, he has a new book out called A Sense of Dread, Getting Under the Skin of Horror Screenwriting. You can find that on Amazon.com. Uh, Neil Marshall Stevens, thank you for joining us today. Uh, you're, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, before we get into the book, as I said, 13 Ghosts, it's one of my favorite films. Uh, it's experiencing its 21st uh, anniversary this year, yeah. the big 20th last year. Yeah, it, wow. Even yeah. for um, a remake, you know, remakes aren't always so well received by the audience. But this, this is one that has endured now over two decades. It has tons of fans, people who still ask for sequels after all these years. Uh, how does it feel, you know, having penned um, a film like that, a sequel that has endured this long? Well, I, I think that the part of the uh, the secret of, of coming up with a sequel that works is really having something new to say about the material. I mean, the same thing with with something like John Carpenter's uh, this, the thing. The original was. Uh, was a really great movie, but he, he found a, a new way to, you know, he went back to the original story with the, the shape-shifting antagonist and made a movie that was really great. And I, you know, I'm not comparing uh, 13 Ghosts to John Carpenter's The Thing, but um, we, we, we tried to find a new take on the material Um and and I think that the idea of the glass house, which was Joel Silver's idea, I can't take credit for it. Um, and he was inspired by the the, the Museum of Natural History's new uh, planetarium, which was a, a giant glass cube. Um, but that idea of the glass house and the glass rooms and the the shifting glass walls um, was a really I think was a really inspired idea. And the idea of the Black Zodiac, which I humbly take credit for myself, um, was also, I, I think, one of those ideas as a basis for the 13 ghosts, the 12 ghosts being the 12 signs of that Zodiac and the 13th ghost, which turns out to be uh, you know, the, the key to solving the mystery. Those were ideas that were really fruitful and that, that kind of made sequel special in a way that the original you know it was was a bit of a pot boiler you know uh <laughs> but you know and 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 of course the design of the the ghosts and and uh was was really quite wonderful and it really worked and and, and a, a great many elements came together the performances were wonderful the actors were we had a great cast and great design of course was was wonderful the music was wonderful and you know so a, a lot of those elements came together to to make to make a movie that that had obviously had an impression on a whole bunch of people and it was was turned out to be quite memorable so definitely i mean uh just reading comments from people talking about the film today they still rave about the mythos that yeah. you helped crafted the black zodiac as you said uh people find that so interesting you know a, a zodiac for hell and all of these ghosts that correspond to it and that just that's just what makes this film so much fun and i wanted to thank you again you were gracious enough to join us um at the frida cinema when we did a screening a couple of years ago you were there with composer john frizzell and you once again came back to join us on uh youtube and zoom when we did that 13 Ghosts of Watch Party did some director's commentary for the film. So folks, you might want to check that out, hear more of Neil Marshall Stevens' uh, words about the film. Uh, but yeah, gr great cast, and thank you for joining us on that one. And now this brings us to your book, um, A Sense of Dread. I, I've, I have my copy here. I've read it uh, three times. Uh, the, 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 the third time I started to do, um, the, the exercises in the book, uh, I, I very much enjoyed this. This is very interesting. It's a book that it seems like it's not just for, um, people who are students of screenwriting, but even if you're just in general interested in, 
uh, the initial stages of creating a film, you know, putting it down on paper, this is a very uh, helpful manual to get a get an understanding of the mindset that uh, you put yourself through to screenwriting. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about A Sense of Dread? Uh, sure. Um, well, I mean, as you may know, I've been writing screenplays most of my life. I mean, I think I, I wrote my first screenplay of all things when I was like 13 years old. That's, that's a long, that's a long time ago because wow. I'm six, I'm 66 now. So, uh, I, I've, I've written well over a hundred screenplays. Um, I've, I've sold, sold, uh, well over 50. I've had, you know, many, many screenplays produced and, uh, you know, I, I, at a certain point, because many of them were in the horror genre, um, I and have been a fan of horror fiction my entire life. Read Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft and William Hope Hodgson and uh, you know horror anthologies, Algernon Blackwood and all of those things. And so, at a certain point, when you you are reading horror and writing horror, you, you begin to develop a sense of just what it is, what the source of of scares are because a lot of movies that purport to be horror try to be horror try to get scares they're not really very scary and the scares at a certain point tend to be predictable and then you hit things that are really scary that just scare the scare the socks off of you and at a certain point especially if you're if you're writing horror you, you begin to be analytical about just what the things are that scare people and why um and i've been uh teaching at uh, david lynch um uh, school for advanced cinematic studies um at uh miu maharishi international university he's big on meditation um but it has a film school, and then I was working at their screenwriting uh, department, and a, a number of uh, this, the professors there had had written books on various things and suggested, well, maybe you should write a book about it. And I, I started thinking seriously about doing that, and so the the question came down to, well, just what's the process? What is it? You know, if you're going to write a scary movie. Um, you have to try to understand uh, in a kind of organized way, what is it that's scary? What is it that you can put on the screen that makes people afraid? And of course, for a lot of movies, a lot of people, they're just talking about jump scares, um, startle, reflex. Um, and that, of course, is biological. Um, you know, you can sneak up on it. Anyone who's owned a cat knows you can sneak up on a cat and just jab the cat the cat will jump up and down it's it's a biological instinct it's true for human beings it's true for cats true for dogs it's true for for pretty much any mammal it, you know it you can tap on the side of a, of a fish tank and the fish will jump around you can you can actually startle a fish so it's it's a very ancient reflex so yes of course you can you know and you you see it anytime where it's like a phone rings and they put a loud they, they make the, the sound of the phone really loud and everyone in the audience jumps so yeah we, we understand that you can always you can always use that startle reflex to get the audience to jump but in, in some way it's just a kind of biological trick and yeah of course i mean anyone who know, who, who like has an annoying friend who'll come up behind you and jab you and you jump at a certain point that just really gets annoying um, and you can you can exhaust that particular kind of scare, and movies that depend upon the startle reflex for their scares are going to wear out their welcome. That's one. Two, you can't do it on the page. 
because it's it's strictly that biological thing. You can say they open the door and somebody jumps out. Yeah. But taking that information in in words can never reproduce the actual experience of surprise that comes from somebody coming up behind you and grabbing you. Um, it, it will not work on the page. And so any kind of movie that really depends on it is going to be very hard to reproduce when you're writing a screenplay. And the whole point of writing a scary movie is you want people to get scared when they read it the same way. If you're writing a comedy, you want people to, to laugh when they read it. You don't want people to have to say, oh yeah, this is going to be the point where it's funny and here's where it's going to be funny and this is where it's going to be funny. But meanwhile, they never laugh when they read it. You want what you're writing to be scary. And that is, is always going to be the goal. And since you can't really reproduce jump scares on the page, you have to depend on something else. And that's what I talk about when I talk about what the sense of dread is. And the sense of dread is what happens when things that we consider to be safe or sacred or inviolate is suddenly or impossibly penetrated by something that is dangerous or unknown or unnatural. And so we always look to those kinds of scenes or sequences or moments. Um, what are our safe spaces? And I go through this in whole chapters, chapters about biological fears and psychological fears and cultural fears. But we, we have seen all of these scenes so many times. We think of, first of all, our bodies are inviolate. So anything that, you know, and certain parts of our bodies much more than others, our faces, eyes, nose, mouth, fingers, toes, extremities. And there's a reason for that because those things tend to have much more nerve endings um, than, than the rest of our bodies. So I think most of us have a real fear of like having our, our noses or our teeth broken or having our eyes injured, having our fingers broken. So anything, any kind, you know, and we've seen scenes like those um, in movies, anytime that, that the eye is injured. Remember the scene from um, uh, Chinatown where uh, – his nose is slit. Nose. <laughs> it's, it's so incredibly horrifying. It's not a horror movie, but that's an incredibly horrifying scene because the idea of getting your nose slit or in Marathon Man, the dental torture scene is just so memorably horrifying. Um, or, you know, scenes where people's hair is being pulled or pulled out same thing as horrifying um the movie uh the exorcist 2 which is a terrible movie um but there's there's one scene in it where richard burton is walking through a deep puddle of water puts his foot down and there are spikes just beneath the level of the water puts his foot down and the spikes come up through his foot and and it's just it's a cringing moment because we again the feet are so sensitive and so we respond instantly to the notion of the of the that man's feet being penetrated by spikes and of course we've seen scenes where where eyes are damaged I mean, it goes goes all the way back to the Xi'an Andalusian Andalusian dogs where a razor blade slices the eyeball and it's just like <sighs> it's horrifying or memorably horrifying image and it, it that goes all the way back to biology a scene in runaway train i don't know if you're familiar with that movie um where um John Voigt is clinging to the, the coupling of a train as a, in motion, like with his fingers. And then the, the train goes around a curve. And as it does, the couplings move just ever so slightly. And it 
crushes the tip of his fingers. We see the blood spurt out, and it's ah, it's horrifying. Same thing. So certain kinds of injuries trigger that biological response, and of course we respond to the sight of blood. It's again, it's built into us. Um, um, on a on a deeper level, stepping up from biology. Um, well, we have fears of certain kinds of living things, scurrying things, for instance. We're we're generally afraid of insects, but for some reason, not exactly sure why, spiders seem to trigger a, a kind of loathing that other insects don't inspire in us quite to the same degree snakes in the same for the same unknown reason what's snake you kids in your imagination we have an incredible horror of snakes and spiders and rats those things rodents spiders snakes just seem to send us over the edge and we don't exactly know why, but they do. Um, and that seems to be built into us. We can't stand those kinds of things. Um, and there are other, you know, we, we head into the, the area of phobias. We have certain kinds of phobias that, for instance, things like fear of flying are grounded in the loss of control um, more than, you know, some of it has to do with balance issues. For instance, people have a fear of heights, fear of falling, all of that. You know, if you're, if you're enclosed, you tend not to be as afraid of falling or of heights than if you're out in the open where the, the actual drop is right at your right immediately available. Um, but a lot of that fear, again, is fear of control. Um, you have all of those nightmares, and they tend to be very common, of finding yourself um, someplace where you, you don't know where you, you're, you're supposed to be someplace. There, you know, it, it's high school, and you're supposed to be in, a, in your exam but you're 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 on the wrong floor, and you don't know the time. You don't know where your class is. It's that that sense of of sudden dislocation. I I'm I'm supposed to be somewhere. Where am I? I don't know. I don't know what time it is. I don't know where my class is. I, I just so that that sense of being yanked out of where you're supposed to be and when you're supposed to be, and not being in control. Again, that lack of control. The, the lack of being in that safe, controlled space is terrifying to us. And the, the, the fear of the intruder in our safe space, likewise, is terrifying. And we have spaces that we consider to be most safe. The home in general, but specifically bedrooms, bathrooms, are always considered to be the places where we permit ourselves to be most vulnerable. In bedrooms, we sleep, we make love. In bathrooms, we bathe, we're naked, we're undressed, we're engaged in other bathroom activities. And when we are in those environments, we permit ourselves the, the maximum vulnerability. And when we are maximally vulnerable, we are we create environments where we expect to be most safe. And so anytime something or someone, a stranger or some thing comes into that space, it is that, that triggers the sense of dread. Um, and of course there are, there are a whole genre of, home invasion movies where I mean that goes all the way back to the beginning of cinema I mean the official genre starts with movies like funny games or what have you but um, 
You can go back to a movie like uh, The Desperate Hours, it's the same kind of thing. There's this average suburban family, and then in comes these desperate people. Um, and the 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 potential menace that they that they pose to this family group because again the family itself is one of those safe sacred spaces so anything that threatens the family immediately triggers that sense of dread uh, and of course you have something like invasion of the body snatchers all of the various groups which have not only the family being threatened and you know the couple relationship being threatened but even the community itself being threatened and that that in itself is terrifying and that that takes us to the larger group of cultural elements so things like our community our country our culture our religion all of those elements that again we consider to be we we those are the the things that we resort to when we need to be protected when we need to be safe when we need to rely upon them and if those things have been in some sense invaded or corrupted then again that that leaves us with no sense of resort and it fills us with a sense of dread if we the, if we go to some place expecting that we're going to be safe and instead we find that no that safe space is infected or has been corrupted or that it's not safe after all we get, where do we go when we want safety we go to the family no the family is has been corrupted it's been taken over in some way it's no longer safe or we go to our homes no the home is not safe you know it, it's corrupted or we we go to the again to the government to the police to to the church to our sacred institutions they're not safe and it's very common for instance um we have all of these uh sacred celebrations things like weddings or birthdays or marriage whatever it is it's very common in horror movies that that filmmakers or storytellers will use those kinds of events and then something horrible will intrude upon them so to say that yes this celebration this birthday party or celebratory environment of some kind and then giant alligator will show up or the zombies will show up or something terrible will happen it will be like the red wedding in in game of thrones the 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 heights are of, of the celebration which should be joyous and should be it should embody that which is safe and protected and normal and joyous is suddenly intruded upon by something that is horrendous and tears everything to pieces. Um, so this brings to me mind um, Damien's birthday party from the Omen. Oh yes, of <laughs> course. This this is for you, Damien. And it's the same thing. Starts out everyone's happy, and then in the midst of it is this nightmare that just breaks it to pieces. Um, and and we see that sort of thing is is uh it, it's fodder for for nightmares it's the same the same way um as as commonplace uh any kind of safety that the bedroom is intruded upon um bathroom is intruded upon um any number of, of things where where someone is in an intimate environment where they should where they have every expectation to feel safe amusement parks um things like that where it's like this is a place where you go to feel happy um then along comes something nightmarish um, so those are the kinds of things that we look for 
for the basis of the sense of dread. That's a kind of normal environment, and we are going to penetrate it with something that is horrific. Or conversely, you have the reverse, which is that you have normal people, and the normal people, for whatever reason, are now going to leave their normal world behind and penetrate some world or some realm that is abnormal or unknown. They're drawn into the darkness. And we see, we have lots of stories like that. I mean, it can it can be anything like the original King Kong, where it's like it starts and it's normal, it's New York City and everything's fine. And then that they're they're led, the map leads them into Kong's nightmare jungle. Um where where it's just they they experience this horrendous world and then what happens is they then they take kong they think well we're going to master kong we're we are civilization we're going to take kong uh, a captive back to civilization and we're going to show so I say we're in charge of kong no nah, not really because you you can't you can't master this force of 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 chaos and kong breaks free and it's it's as much of a nightmare now in in the civilized world as it was back in Kong's Island. So it's you know you you can you can temporarily destroy what Kong embodies, but it can never really be tamed. Mm. So so um, and if you've ever seen I don't know if you've seen the original uncut Kong, it's so, just some truly nightmarish material in that movie. Um, Definitely just, those attacks with the log going down and the, yeah, the yeah, monsters yeah, down yeah, in the yeah, yeah, in the valley. Yeah. yeah, or just just been scenes in with Kong in in New York City where he's like searching for Andaro, and he he just reaches into the window, and pulls a, a sleeping woman out of her bed. No, not her, and just drops her. This is like this is now yeah, wrong woman, and just she goes flying, you know, just tumbling down to her death. It's just, just. I mean, it's it's the stuff of nightmares. Um, but uh, and and uh, you know, you you will you'll find a movie like uh, Island of Doctor Moreau again. Normal people find themselves stranded in the midst of this nightmarish realm. Um. Moreau's Moreau's man-made nightmare, um, and and have to try to kind of struggle to drag themselves back to to some to some semblance of reality, you know. It's sort of, you know, and it, it's interesting as they're as they're rowing away and and you know they start to you know one of them starts to look says like, don't look back. As as island goes up in flames, it's almost like looking back toward uh, um, towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Turning, you know, it's like you know, don't you don't even want to look back at that at the at the hell of of Moreau being diced, being vivisected by his own creations. Mm -hmm. No, um, but uh, no, yeah, I've yeah, loved. Yeah. Um, I very much enjoyed your your book. Uh, it's de definitely worth several reads, um, just to be able to and uh, enjoy uh, being able to apply the the lessons of your book to the films that I have previously watched and uh, new films that I've watched. I I very much enjoyed watching Jordan Peele's Nope, uh, thinking about your book about. Um, the 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 sense of dread in the film nope that i get in the 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 openness being on the ranch there with um with the characters and the primal fear of spoiler alert for any or i'm sorry i don't want to spoil yeah. nope have for you have, yeah, uh, i actually haven't seen it yet but i'm yeah okay the, yeah, I, he's, I, he's, uh, yeah. there, there's some good lessons to be uh to be uh noticed in that film uh that you'll learn from a, a sense of dread uh, but even for fan fans of 13 ghosts they can apply uh a lot of this to that film the idea of uh the family uh going to this mysterious home that turns out not to be a home um these horrific ghosts uh with these terrible wounds and um 
damage to their body that would just make anyone quiver. And then to find out that turns out that the real villain is somebody from your own family, this this, yeah. this Cyrus. And so I, I know fans of your previous work are going to get a lot out of this book and be able to look at old films just like that and really get a, a genuine appreciation of any new films they watch. So yeah. I wanted to thank you so much uh, for joining me here, uh, Neil. This has been really great. And uh, please, uh, where, where can fans find you? Are you on Instagram? Um, I'm, I'm on Facebook, but I am sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm so darn old. I don't, I don't, I don't do much on social media these days, but uh, I'll, I'll try to do better. I, 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 no, I that, that's, that's, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We'll have you again on on an, on another show, and maybe we'll we'll do some more uh, thirteen ghosts celebrating now that the okay. pandemic's over. But Sounds uh, good. folks, once again, check out his book, "A Sense of Dread: Getting Under the Skin of Horror Screenwriting." Please check it out on Amazon.com. Get your copy now. Thank you, Neil Steve. Thank You're you. You're very welcome. Bye bye. <laughs>